Hello. In this video, we're going to look at how to have a program in Java access the current time and do some basic manipulation with that. So, when I was first asked this question, I didn't know how to do it, and I did a quick Google search, and this was the page that I came up with. So I figured we'd start here. I always tell my students that um, they might think I know a great deal about programming, but I don't. Um, one of the things you want to do as a programmer is become very good at learning things and finding things that you need to learn. So though I don't have a huge amount of knowledge, I'm very good at finding the knowledge that I need and putting it into practice. So here, we have this chunk of code here that's interesting. So if you're working along with me, you can copy this code um, and put it into a main method. To find this website, you can usually do a Google search for accessing time in Java. So I'm going to jump into my IDE here, and here is the code. So a couple things. Um, we use the calendar class, and we use the simple date format class, and those are both not in the standard lang library, the java.lang library, so we need to import those. Um, you may or may not have actually started talking about what objects are. Um, in my class, we haven't formally really defined objects or created or worked a lot with objects. We use some basic ones, such as the scanner class, um, creating a scanner object to take inputs. But we're, we're getting a better handle on it. So for our purposes right now, you can think of a, this as a fancy variable. We're making what's called a calendar object. And then what we're doing is we're, we're accessing a method in the calendar class. So again, Becoming a good programmer is learning how to actually pick up the grammar. And if you understand the grammar, you can figure out what pretty much anything is doing with a little bit of just detective work. So when I look at this, what I recognize right away is that I'm accessing the calendar class and I'm accessing the method get instance. So if I wanted to do a little bit more reading on this, I could pop up a web page and I could do a Google search for the calendar class in Java. And if I scroll down here, there's lots of information here. Again, we want to learn how to read this. There's so much here, you'll never memorize it all. And we find the get instance method here. And we see that it returns what's called a calendar object. So again, when you're reading methods, you want to take note of a couple things. The name of the method, the parameters or what it takes. In this case, we see get instance takes nothing and what it returns. And it returns calendar. The other word that's really interesting here is the word static. Now we haven't defined what the word static means, but we have talked about it because it's come up a couple times. A static method is a method that you call with the name of the class. That's how we could define it at this point. If you want to be a little bit more detailed about that, you could say a static method is called without needing an instance of the class. But for our purposes right now reading these, if you're trying to do some reading on your own or exploring some other class, which I encourage, you see the word static, you know that you need to type the name of the class in order to access the method. So now if we come back here, we see calendar. So this tells me that get instance is static and it's the method in the calendar class. So we make another object called a simple date format. And what this does is converts our, our calendar object into a format that's easy to read. There's lots of ways to, to, to change the format to suit your needs. Again, I'm just doing this one example based on what was given me on this web page. And I think this is really nice because it lets us work on our manipulation of strings ideas. So what this means is that when we access the calendar object, the actual data is going to give it to me in the format of hours, minutes, and seconds. So again, if I want to read about this format method, I'm accessing the format method using the SDF object. And since I'm not using the class simple date format, the method format should not be a static method. Let's go in and take a look and see if we're right. So this is a simple date format class. Let's find format. There's going to be 178 definitions, so let's just scroll down to it. So we're looking for the format example that we have, and I've gone and clicked into that, and here it is. So it takes a date object, which is our calendar object. Okay, um, 
this can be all be very confusing if you haven't actually studied object-oriented programming yet but what I do encourage you to do is do some reading on your own okay um, it's really easy in programming just to go and copy code and paste it in which is sometimes fun to get your desired result but also think about what it's actually doing so if we run this what we see is that it gives me the time that I'm working on this so it says 15 49 32 and if I wait 15 49 38 so it's currently 3 49 38 seconds and that's how I get the time now perhaps I want to do some math with this perhaps I want to check how long until the next minute so the, the challenge, and this is really important to understand, is that this time is a string. You can see here it's stored in T1, so I can't do any mathematical manipulation. So I need to do two things. I need to access the second part, and the second thing I need to do is convert it to an integer so I can do some basic math. So if we run this, we notice that the string is always 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8 characters long. And that includes the colons there. So I can access the 2, 3 using a substring method. So if I start, I want the 2, and I, I'm going to use substring where I have to put the starting index to 1 past the last index. So we know that 2 is in position 6, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. And we want 3, which is in position 7, so we're going to go 2 to 8. So if I make, so if I go, for example, t1, t1 is equal to t1.substring 6, 8, what I then do is I access, sorry, I don't want to put it there, t1 is equal to t1.substring. 6, 8, and let's just, so we understand this, system.out.println, you'll see now that it accessed just the seconds, so there's 33 seconds. Let's run this again, 38, 39. But now I can't do any math with this because it's currently a string, so I want to convert t1 from a string to an integer. And it turns out there's a really nice method in the integer class called parse int. So it works as follows. Let's make an integer called seconds or sec. And we'll just set it to zero for now. So if we go sec is equal to, it's a static method, meaning I call it with the name of the class, which is the integer class. And the method is called parse int. And I pass parse int a string. So if I hover over parse int, you'll see it takes a string and it returns an integer. The method is static, meaning I call it with the integer class, or the name of the class that it's in, in this case, the integer class. And so what it does is it makes seconds now an integer. So I can actually do some math with this. So if I say seconds is equal to 60 minus seconds, because that will give me how many seconds till the next minute, I can then say, It will be until the next minute. So if I run this now, so notice it is one second into the 53rd minute, so it's 59 seconds till the next minute. If I run this again, 50 seconds. So a really simple kind of silly example here, but it gets the point across is that I access the time in the system and it's a string so I have to take part of that using my substring method here and then I need to convert it to an integer if I want to go through any mathematical operations or I want to do some comparison using greater than or equal to or less than or equal to or greater than or less than. Now if I wanted to use say I wanted to figure out how long it took for someone to answer a question that's an interesting idea that means I'm going to have to take the time more than once and so one thing you can do is you can actually take this, this code here to calculate the time and put it into a method. And that's what we've done in this example here. So what we've done is we've created a method here called findTime. And when we invoke findTime or call findTime, it returns the time as a string.
So what this means is I could do something like this. I could make, I could take an input. So let's go name. I could say something like system.out.print. Input your name. Name. Oh, pardon me. Name is equal to s.next. Your name is, okay, so something pretty simple, just taking your name. But what I could do here is, this is time one. Let's make it time two. And I can find the time again. So I can do system.out.println. It was time one before the question. It was time two after the question. So let's try and run this and see what happens. And you can put your name, Paul. It was 1555.35 before the question. It was 1555.38 after the question. So in your game, if, if for example, you want to have a different response based on how long it took the user to enter a question, this is one way you could do this. But of course, you do have to do some manipulation and measurement of the change in time. So I hope this video helped. I'm talking for a minute or two on this screen, so if you do want a copy of this code, you can do this. Again, as always, if you have any questions, don't hesitate to let me know. Have a great day.